Hello and welcome to Evil Dread. I'm Wyeth and this week Lynn is out of town, so Anne Louise has graciously returned to us. Yes, he, he is Wyeth and I am not Lynn. Not Lynn. We have not Lynn today. <laughs> Lynn is missed, but not R.I.P. yet, thankfully. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, so because of your guest status, we I thought it would be fun to let you have the pick this week. And what did you pick? Uh, this week we watched Cloverfield, mm-hmm. the 2008 found footage giant monster movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a real Venn diagram for, for us. Mm-hmm. I have studied found footage movies. You like giant monsters, so... It's a <laughs> match made in heaven. <laughs> And we also watched uh, 2016's surprise hit, Tin Cloverfield Lane, which both movies kind of came out of nowhere mm-hmm. in yeah. terms of production and release, which I thought made them all the more fun. Just kind of like a surprise genre movie. Yeah, um, it was originally, so it by the original Cloverfield movie, I guess, was kind of a mysterious production, mm-hmm. right? It was initially just being called 11808 because that was the release date, mm-hmm. January 18th. And it was, yeah, it was very, very mysterious as to what it was. I remember high school wife thinking that I should go see this new, uh, this new Michael Bay Transformers movie. <laughs> oh, how young and little did I know. Really? You weren't? You weren't going to go see it because of J.J. Abrams, though? What? Cloverfield. Oh, no, I'm talking about Transformers, the first Transformers movie. I know, but why would you go and see that when I know that you're such a big Lost fan? What? J.J. Abrams, right? Did what? Oh, wait, that wasn't him that did Lost, no. was it? Never mind. Well, he <laughs> backed Lost, but no, I was in the theaters for Transformers, and the, the first teaser trailer for Cloverfield played... And it was, like, it really captured my attention. Because mm-hmm. it was very mysterious. It opened on, like, a found footage of a party. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of a sudden, like, something attacks New York. And it cuts to the release date. And so I remember, like, well, the only thing I remember about that movie is, like, waiting for it to be over to go. By movie, I mean Transformers. <laughs> Just I'm wait. upset. I'm I'm upset with you for bringing up Transformers at all in this episode. But okay, it was it was worth it to see this <laughs> teaser on the big screen, like with no preparation. So I remember running home and circa 2007, why trying to find any news about it on the internet. Mm-hmm. Um, there wasn't really Reddit back then, so I just had to find like a few movie boards, and there was like what. One of the big speculations was uh, that it was going to be a Voltron movie. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. That that was going around. Really? That was, that's that was a serious rumor. That's then. so crazy. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, backing up um, a little bit, I think it's worth discussing briefly. Uh, what did you think about choosing for this week's movie? Oh, yeah. So <laughs> when we talk <laughs> about uh, <laughs> just a Venn diagram, because... I could have, I could have chosen a film, you know, I could have chosen another found footage film that I'm very familiar with, just to make myself seem very smart, so I briefly entertained doing a Paranormal Activity movie, one of the sequels, because um, I think both 2 and 3 are vastly superior to the original. Really? Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll get around to watching those sometime in the future, but... The other, the other main thing that was in competition was 1972's Night of the Lepus, which is another sort of intersection because it's about a uh, about <laughs> giant monsters that are brought about by, you know, science science going too far. Science but, run amok. Yeah, but of course, in Night of the Lepus, the giant, <laughs> the giant terrifying animals that grow to. <laughs> Like grow, man-sized. Yeah, grow to... They're like trampling towns, though. What? But yeah, it's 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 bunnies. Giant bunnies. <laughs> so, if you have never heard of this before, please pause this 
and go to YouTube and watch the trailer for Night of the Lepus. Mm-hmm. Um, it is essentially if someone... This was before Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah, around the same time. So yeah. this is basically if, if someone took the, the killer bunny and made a movie out of it, except somehow less gory. I mean, basically, the trailer in particular is is amusing to watch. It's it's great to show if you if you have somebody in your life to show it to that don't that know nothing about the film. Mm-hmm. You can just show them the trailer and then say, "What do you think this <laughs> this movie is about?" Because really, it's very clear that whoever was editing that trailer together was just like, "Okay, it's a horror movie." You cannot show any bunnies. <laughs> no one. We the, we cannot show the the giant monster in this movie, and not in a cool like Jaws way, where less is more. Mm-hmm. But it's just not... the concept is too ludicrous. So so the whole the trailer is just a very grindhouse. They come at night mm-hmm. when you least expect it. Yep. And then I watched. Then we watched some clips from it. And it's like people screaming poorly, juxtaposed, juxtapositioned with zoom ins on bunnies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the trailer just does its best by using an extreme close up of a of a rabbit's eye. But you you know that could be anything. Yeah, I guess. It said, I mean, <laughs> said you got fluffy bunnies covered in fake blood. Yeah. It's adorable. I mean, I still want to watch that movie. Someday. (laughs) Well, we did not watch that, so we watched something, I would say, a lot more uh, well-made. Yeah, so, I mean, we both both own this film, Mm -hmm. so I guess it's pretty safe to say that you, we both like it enough to to own it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. What did, when was the last time you watched this movie, I guess? Halloween... 2014. Okay. Because um, I I was still I was living at home right before I started um, grad school, and I'm like, well, it's Halloween. Uh, no one, everyone else is off having parties. I'm just going to have my own <laughs> my own movie marathon. <laughs> and so I watched 2000. I watched no, it was 2015. Yeah, 2015. Um, so I watched like. The 2014 Gareth Edwards Godzilla, um, mm-hmm. Pacific Rim, and then Cloverfield. Um, my dad stuck through all three of the movies. Oh, wow. Well, he actually left during Cloverfield because he thought, it, out of the three, he thought it was the most stupid. Really? Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's harsh. It's a harsh review from Mike. <laughs> my, Mike has surprising <laughs> opinions every now and then, but he, he didn't like the characters. Yeah, that's kind of... Um... That was one of the big... Critiques that's of that a, movie. That's a critique for sure. Um, what did you think about it this time around? I guess. Um, I still really like it. I still feel like the characters are people that I would know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess maybe we should pause for a moment and do a very brief plot synopsis. Um, as Wyeth already said, and as the teaser trailer indicated, it's basically. Found footage movie shot, uh, the initial sort of conceit of them filming is because it's a going away party for Rob, Mm -hmm. who is a blandly attractive guy. (laughs) These, all these (laughs) characters are what I call proto-hipsters. Okay, what does that mean? (laughs) They, they feel like they were the first hipsters. Hmm. I mean, they do. The first live, they wave. Do, they do live. The first in, wave of hipsters, Brooklyn. Yeah, they do live in Brooklyn, I guess. Um, so they start out by just sort of filming testimonials for Rob's goodbye party. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this is this the first sort of notable thing that T.J. Miller does? I had never heard of him before this movie. Um. Yeah. I really, really, I. I didn't know of him before this movie, and then he was in the How to Train Your Dragon movies, and that was when he was started to up and come until mm-hmm. Deadpool was kind of his big thing. And Hulk, was it Silicon Valley? Yeah. Yeah, Silicon, R.I.P. T.J. Miller on Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is pre, 
TJ Miller saying that the emoji the emoji movie was going to be the future of comedy. What? Oh yeah. <laughs> That's Oof. the thing that happened. The true horror. Darkness. Um, so yeah, he he's sort of our POV character. He's the cameraman named mm-hmm. named Hudson or HUD. He gets <laughs> he gets all the great lines. Yeah. Um it's been a while since I saw any of the like director commentary or anything on this film. Um but I would be interested to know how much of the dialogue is ad libbed, particularly on his end. I feel it like it seems very natural. Mm-hmm. I feel like probably a lot. I was thinking about that during the movie, and especially the party scenes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so he he's our voice behind the camera. Mm-hmm. Um, the other sort of main characters that we're introduced to, aside aside from Rob, who is leaving to go to Japan. We have uh, his brother, Jason, uh, Jason's girlfriend, Lily, and Marlena, who's played by Lizzie Kaplan. So, who's the real MVP of the movie. <laughs> and then uh, very briefly, we have Beth, who is only only at the party for a few minutes because she and Rob have, have a tortured past. Mm-hmm. Real, and yet, and yet, uh, will they, won't they? <laughs> yeah, and yet she is the character that we're, you know, everybody else in the film cares deeply about. And the audience is, I guess, sort of expected to also care about Beth. <laughs> mm-hmm. When it's kind of like, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's found footage and that really limits the... I mean, they do work in flashbacks, which I think is a really neat mm-hmm. trick. Yeah. But it's very limited perspective. Yes. So I feel like the ability for, like, emotional context is hard to do in found footage. Um, yes, I would agree, I guess, mostly. It could be, it could be done. I just don't think I've ever really seen. Well, I feel like, I feel like there are more or maybe it's more publicized the examples of when people are not able to do that. Like, I think one of the main critiques of the original Paranormal Activity was that the two main characters in that film are very unlikable. <laughs> mm-hmm. Katie and Mika. Uh, yeah, they're, they're not a good couple. They're very grating. So I think that was sort of a, a main critique of that film, whereas the later the later sequels, I would say, the characters are a little bit more. I guess I guess I'm trying to say that it's more noticeable when when it's done poorly. Yeah, when characters are unlikable, um, because hypothetically, the the true effect of a found footage film should be kind of like watching somebody else's home movies, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you're watching anybody, any random person's home movies, you're not going to be able to get. A sense of the, the, full the breadth of their like their soul or anything you're just going yeah. to be able to see little slices so kind of building off of that one of the big critiques of cloverfield when it came out was a lot of people were saying why would they keep filming yeah um do you think that holds up because i mean we live now here in 2017 Everyone is filming on their iPhones. Yeah, I would say that's probably the main sort of difference would be, you know, this could be a movie if they wanted to remake it, they could just remake it and use a phone Mm -hmm. instead. But yeah, at the time, I don't know. It's just, I mean, the genre calls for it. So it's kind of, I don't know. I can't ever really get too hung up on that as a as a plot hole yeah. <laughs> or a, you know it's like they have to keep filming because that's the movie that's the genre that the film yeah. is in <laughs> but i feel like i mean it's the same as asking logistical questions of you know oh why do people decide to split up and search the house you know mm-hmm. well because they do because that's <laughs> that's the movie yeah but i feel like it's more like people would bat and i would less bat an eye about it here now because of how rampant like 
social media recording is. Yeah. It feels more natural. I would agree with that. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> we do see uh, we do see a lot of a lot of old flip phones. Oh, the of... technology in this movie is dated. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine anybody was getting good photos on those those 2008 flip phones. Mm -mm. Those Nokia ads when, that are so prominently placed everywhere. <laughs> when the when the Statue of Liberty's head just happens to land outside of their Brooklyn loft, <clears throat> um, everyone takes out their flip phones and <laughs> starts taking pictures. Yeah, you're not going to get a good picture with that. Mm -mm. Um, I remember that was, space. that was uh, that was the teaser trailer, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of it's sort of a little subgenre of movies where the trailers aren't really like edited together, but it's, they choose to just include like a scene. And I remember the Cloverfield teaser trailer just including, you know, basically that two minutes of footage between some kind of, you know, what looks kind of like comets or whatever, yeah. hitting, hitting buildings from there to ultimately this very sort of iconic shot of the Statue of Liberty's head rolling down the street and then coming to a stop in front of their apartment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you think this movie holds up? I do. Um... I can't say that I feel as strongly about it as I do some of some of my other found footage horror movies that I like. I think as overexposed as it is, I don't know that, you know, Cloverfield holds up as well as the Blair Witch Project, for mm -hmm. example. Um, but I I always I always enjoy watching it. I haven't gotten tired of it and that has definitely not been the case for some of the other movies that I have <laughs> that I have written papers about. There are some movies where I have to take months, year-long breaks before <laughs> I can even think about watching them again. <laughs> yeah, this I still really love Cloverfield. Mm -hmm. um, when I first, I, it was a day one viewing for me. Like I, because I was still in high school, so I, as soon as high school let out that Friday. I went with some friends to see it, and they didn't like it. And mm -hmm. I think they they were partially um, just predisposed against it because they both got motion sick oh, during yeah. this movie. That's and <laughs> and this movie, yeah, is very shaky. My yeah, my mom, you know, she tries to care a lot about my academic interests and stuff, but she also is extremely sensitive to that sort of oh, thing no. to shaky cans so when i was doing a lot of my my work on these movies she had to kind of just be like i'll take your word for it <laughs> <laughs> i can't watch these movies um i but it's like just a movie it's it's directed by matt reeves who i have a lot of respect for mm -hmm. um let early on in this podcast show um, I said that, like, I don't really go on my way to watch vampire movies. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not really my thing. But his, um, American adaptation of Let the Right One In, Let Me In, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's really underrated. Or at least underseen. I, I haven't seen it. Well, it's... It, I was, I was prejudiced against it. <laughs> I liked it better than the, than the Swedish mm -hmm. version. So that's my hot take of the day. <laughs> For but, now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who knows what will happen in five minutes. But yeah, he d he balances this movie really well. It's, uh, it feels very grounded. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, like, it's funny. Yeah. Like, TJ Miller has a lot of great lines, and Marlena has also some real mm -hmm. scene-stealing lines. But it's also a very dark movie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do... I do appreciate that there's kind of a small sort of throwaway, not a throwaway, but, you know, a relatively minor plot thread of HUD having a crush on Marlena, and he comes across very kind of heavy-handed at first, mm -hmm. um, 
But then when they both get sort of thrust into this, like, you know, hellish survival situation, I felt... I felt like they could have made it a little bit more heavy handed with the like, you know, she sort of eventually comes around to, I don't know, warms to him a little bit. It's never like overly romantic. Yeah, but it's not, it's in no way like a secondary love story, which is in keeping with the time frame of this movie, which is basically it takes place over what, like eight, seven hours, Mm -hmm. something like that. This is a very quick movie. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, I will say I think I also like this movie a lot when compared to other giant monster movies, uh-huh. um, <laughs> because no, I appreciate I appreciate that there's no none of the characters is like a scientist, mm-hmm. so there's no you know we don't get that perspective that we have a lot of the time in. Godzilla movies or anything along those lines where there's some kind of specialist who is like, I know what's going on. Let me tell you about it. It's just these people who are scared shitless <laughs> running for their lives. And, you know, when they have like a lull, they're kind, they're kind of idly speculating. Like, maybe it came from the ocean. Maybe, it, maybe the government yeah. knew about it. Mm-hmm. Who knows? But there's never, like, I've never really been... I've never gone into the research, the like the lore. Yeah, no, I've I've never been into that. Did... I I enjoy it well enough as just like these are some normal people reacting to an extraordinary situation. I did you get into the viral marketing? I got into it because I wrote a paper on it. Oh. <laughs> um. So, but I was never like into it at the time. Like, because the possibility of, like, a giant monster. Because before, right, in the months after the teaser hit the web, mm-hmm. um, like, all, everyone was speculating. Um, seems like every other day, someone would claim to have a picture of the monster, but it would turn out to be, like, something ripped from a deviant art account. <laughs> okay. And so I was, I was really into... I know this isn't real because there's Evanescence lyrics on it. <laughs> <laughs> but the viral marketing just made me really excited because it felt like there was this whole universe and I just love any information I can about like So did you, monsters. you get into like all the MySpace accounts and stuff? Mm-hmm. It was 2008, guys. MySpace was a thing. They made MySpace pages for these characters. Mm-hmm. I want. Are does MySpace still have profiles for the characters, or just in general? In, in, in general, I know it's. I isn't it strictly a, a music site? I have no idea. I haven't been to MySpace in in years. Sometimes I I worry about visiting such sites because I don't want to just show up and it be like an abandoned ghost town. <laughs> Why are you, are you nervous about something happening? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's just it's just weird, and it reminds me of weird high school me. Yeah, I I can understand that <laughs> that part at least. But anyway, the viral marketing made a whole universe for all these different aspects. Yeah, there was a a website for the company that Rob works for. Which is involved with Slush Show, which yes. is, if you if you follow J.J. Abrams at any length, you might, it's a common running visual thing in his movies, or in his universe, um, it's in the Star Trek, mm-hmm. the recent Star Trek them. movies, it's yeah. all of them, yeah. Um, it's in the Cloverfield movies, and it's in a bunch of things. It's in uh, Alias. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, a uh, a drink called Slusho, um, and there's sort of a shady, a shady past in that there's you know the implication from this website is that whatever the ingredients are that are in Slusho make it very addictive, and they are being gathered from the bottom of the sea, mm-hmm. so so much so that this company is having to finance deeper and riskier drilling projects into the bottom of the ocean. The sort of implication, I guess, being that one of these things is what awakens this monster. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, do you want to talk about just the monster design? I would love to. Okay. Um, Clover? Clover, yeah. Nicknamed Clover. 
Uh, it's a really unique design. Like, it feels very grounded in reality. Okay. Um, it feels like, it looks like something you could easily just stumble upon at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, it's very, very, yeah, kind of crab-like a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, like, all its limbs are very thin. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's very spindly. And, like, a lot of giant monster designs are just kind of, like, extravagant, like, mm -hmm. or big. And this one, like, the viral... It wasn't part of the viral marketing, but was it Mount Reeves? I was like, yeah, it's baby. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't think it was part of the marketing. I think it's something that was sort of pointed out afterward. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think once you learn, you know, word of God that this is a baby creature, for me anyway, it totally changes my reading of the film because I think you know, for the majority of giant monster movies there's an you know a tendency to read in like malicious intent on the part of whatever monster is smashing mm -hmm. a city but you know the director saying this is a baby that's been woken up <laughs> and finds itself in this very scary alien environment and all the baby wants to do is get back to its mom so that like kind of flips the script, I think. So yeah. the second time that you watch it with that in mind, it's it's a different viewing experience. Um, this we watched it two nights ago, and I don't like the like. I don't feel bad for it now, because hmm. like the older I get, the more I really root for the human characters, mm. and I mean spoilers, it eats. T.J. Miller. It does. I don't even know if it eats him, though. It just kind of chomps on him. <laughs> it, like, it, like, bites him and chews him around and spits him out. And it's, yeah. like, this really awful... Well, a lot of the death scenes we see on screen are really bad. Well, I mean, I think it's actually maybe kind of important to point out that we don't really see a lot. Like, in terms That's of, true. you know, a lot of the sort of graphic violence in this film is really implied it's in the sound yeah it's in the sound design for sure um so jason for example just gets sort of swatted down i guess standing on the brooklyn yeah bridge. he's on a bridge that gets uh destroyed by clover um hud as we mentioned gets kind of chomped on but we don't see any, we see sort of the aftermath, we see him lying on the ground. Parts of him, yeah. Afterward. Um, ultimately, our two sort of romantic leads get destroyed, not by the monster, but by the bombing that the government has had to do to sort of destroy all of Manhattan at the mm -hmm. end of the film. But then I guess the other sort of thing is when Marlena dies, her death is behind a curtain. Yeah. So we see... It's kind of a little bit of an alien thing, right? Well, Where... let's, let's back up. Okay. <laughs> so, the, like, it's scary enough and it's horrific enough because um, having something attack the city, like, it's very evocative of a terrorist attack. Yeah, there was a lot of discussion, you know, the shots that happen early on in the film before the monster is even really a factor when mm -hmm. it's just some sort of unknown thing that are making these buildings collapse. There's a lot of shots um, that are really reminiscent of, like, 9-11 imagery. Mm -hmm. And you hear people on the street, like, in the immediate aftermath when they don't know what's happened because they don't have, it, they don't have like, mm -hmm. Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, there's no instant news. Um, someone asked, do you think it's a terrorist attack? Mm -hmm. But then later on they, when they start to piece together what's happening and that there's a giant monster in the city um they watch they're they're in a electronic store and there are a bunch of people watching the news and it's revealed that like spidery parasites are falling off of clover's body yeah it's is there a name an official name for those things no not that i'm aware yeah, of yeah i'm not sure what what to call them they're just like evil skin lice <laughs> and they're they're just skittery they yep. they are all mouth and legs. legs. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you were to give like a spider a really bad attitude and a gaping mouth, 
that's more or less what you would have. Yeah. And and they our do, they do make sort of like weird rodent rodent like noises. Yeah, like it, it's very... funny. It's it's like <laughs> ow, 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 ow. And the whole thing, the whole podcast from now on is just going to be us just making, skittering, just trying to make those noises. <laughs> but at one point, the the gang is walking through subway tunnels mm-hmm. to try and avoid uh, um, the the military action, and they stumble upon a group of these parasites, mm-hmm. and um, one of them bites Marlene, Marlena, and she starts to get sick. Yep. And they stumble upon, like, a military ICU. Yeah, it's in a, it's in the subway station they've converted it, right? It's into a, a military it, base. It's like a mall. They come out of the they subway come up station into, into a, a mall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then Marlena starts to bleed from her eyes, mm-hmm. and a nurse screams, we have a bite. Yeah. And... Marlena's taken behind into like a contamination tent where you just see her shadowy outline as mm-hmm. her stomach expands and ruptures. Yeah, and we see, um, I guess maybe the most graphic image that we see is that mm-hmm. body that gets wheeled past really quickly before this happens. Um, just a body on a stretcher where the whole sort of torso has been blown open. And, and you hear a voice say, it was another bite. Yep. So we don't see, we don't actually see our our uh, our character die, but it's implied and yeah, I I enjoyed that just sort of part of like the larger sort of mythology of mm-hmm. whatever these things are. Again, just sort of a real glancing thing. Like, okay, I I don't know. Is this do those little lice grow up to be clovers or you know? There's not really. Any There's sort of there was a a manga hmm. that had a bunch of like background detail for this universe, okay. but I don't know how. Canon. I'm not, I'm not I don't really interested, canon. to be honest. Like, I don't know. I I feel like a big part of the appeal for this mo- of this movie for me is just like. The character's not knowing anything. Less is more. Yeah. The character's not knowing anything, and thus I have never really been interested in finding out the sort of, like, history or the, mm-hmm. you know, the background, except for when I have to write a term paper on it. Then I have to find that stuff out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, Marlena's death is awful. That's mm-hmm. still, like, one of the worst deaths in a movie. Yeah. Lizzie Kaplan is very charming too. So I believe that. It's sad to see her go. Mm-hmm. Because then we're just left with Rob. <laughs> Good old Rob. He tries. Yeah. What do you think of? I guess. What do you think of the characters that aren't T.J. Miller and Lizzie Kaplan? Um. I mean, they're not. They're definitely not as engaging, mm-hmm. but they still feel like people I would know. Yeah. Um. Beth feels more, feels kind of like a, because like we mentioned, we don't really get too much information about her other than the flashbacks. Mm-hmm. So she kind of ends up feeling like a MacGuffin. Uh, she's absolutely a MacGuffin. <laughs> yes. Um, a MacGuffin, basically something that you have to go get. It drives because, the plot Because forward. the plot says you have to go mm-hmm. get her. But at the same time, like... We hear stories of, like, especially right now with all the hurricanes affecting uh, the United States, you hear stories about people doing heroic things like this. Yeah. And, like, reviews of Cloverfield at the time were very critical of this group's decision to go across the city and rescue one person, but I feel like that's kind of a dick thing to say. (laughs) Like, why wouldn't you want to go rescue someone you love and care about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think for as sort of little characterization as a movie like this allows, I do find the sort of quiet, dramatic scenes affecting. Mm-hmm. So, for example, after they've decided to move into the subway, 
there's a sort of scene where they're just kind of waiting. They're waiting it out to see what happens because they've gone underground due to the military firebombing the area that they were in. Mm -hmm. And Rob takes a call from his mom and he has to break the news to his mother that his older brother is dead. And there's a really just sort of the scene between him and Lily where you can't hear, you know, you can't really hear anything that they're saying. It's shot from across the subway station. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I found just sort of little moments like that. Very effective. Yeah. I like that this movie compared to a lot of other found footage, it feels more like actual found footage. Yeah. Um, like it can't, the camcorder can't magically pick up whispering in the distance. Yep. And there's no, like, there's no music. Like, yes. some, like one of the most jarring things for me is when found footage has music. Um, like, the, have you seen The Last Exorcism? Mm -mm. I think it's a very good movie. Mm -hmm. It's very effective. But at one point, music starts playing over some of the footage. And she's like, hmm. who okayed that production idea? Yeah, the only music that we get is... Uh you know, music that is diegetic, so, like, mm -hmm. stuff that that's, that's on at the party. Yeah. Um, Which has a pretty great playlist. <laughs> it really is, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the decision, I guess, like, this is sort of, I mean, at its base, it is supposed to be among the most amateurish of found footage films, because mm -hmm. a lot of them have the sort of conceit that, you know, Blair Witch Project, obviously, like, the characters in that are aspiring filmmakers, even though their documentary, I don't think, would have turned out to be very good. <laughs> it would have been very much a student film. <laughs> um, but, you know, them, stuff like Paranormal Activity, there's always kind of an, a scene early on where it's established, like, okay, you know, I got this camcorder, and we're gonna, you know, like we're going to try and record what's been going on or whatever it is. Whereas this is really a, you know, supposed to be like a movie about a party that just gets interrupted by a monster. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which there can be, there can be, there are a few finer um, plot synopsis in my opinion. <laughs> you wish all parties ended that way. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, I will say though, I do think that the, it makes really good use of, all of the different sort of features of a camcorder. Mm -hmm. So the, I guess the sort of the biggest jump scare in the film comes when they are in the dark of the subway tunnels. Ooh, that still creeps me out. Mm -hmm. They're in the dark of the subway tunnels and uh, it gets pointed out that the camera that they're using has night vision, a night vision mode. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't until the camera gets switched into night vision mode that then we have we're able to see all of these horrible spider crab things. <laughs> something are... terrible. Yep, something terrible. <laughs> yeah, what is that? I don't know, something terrible. <laughs> <laughs> something else, also terrible. Yep, pretty much. I would like to think that T.J. Miller made those lines up. I, I, I believe that. Uh, aside from the sort of critique of whether or not an act of heroism is worth structuring this plot around were there any other sort of uh instances of like things that strained your credulity i guess things that you found hard to believe honestly no i think it's a very tightly made movie mm -hmm. um i have in the past been skeptical as to whether or not beth would have lived but Ha taking another look at the way that she is so when they get to when they get to beth she has been uh, her building has partially collapsed due to the monster and she has been pinned in place by some kind of metal support it's a rod. it's a re mm -hmm. rebarb mm -hmm. wire it's pinned her in place to the floor mm -hmm. of her apartment and in the past i've been extremely skeptical that she would even be alive when they got there but I feel like now I'm walking back that opinion. I feel like they placed it it's high in, enough. It's in her shoulder. It's high enough because 
previously, I was like, that would have absolutely punctured through her lung. Yeah. But I feel like now that I'm looking at it again, I do think they put it up high enough that she she could live. <laughs> and and so I, have, I take that back. I don't think the blood loss would have been too much because of right because the thing is still in place. Mm-hmm. Right. Hypothetically, she could have bled out once they took her off. But. Yeah. Put some pressure on that after you pull. I it also off. kind of enjoyed. This is like a very minor sort of sort of note. But I enjoyed that uh, she leaves the party early Mm -hmm. because she gets into a fight with Rob and she has gone back to her apartment. So then I just like that the next time we see her, she is in pajamas that are like normal pajamas that I would wear, like a t-shirt and some like comfy pants, as opposed to like a negligee or, you know, anything sort of more exploitative. It's like, nope, she got pinned to the floor and she was wearing like her sort of Normal, sweatpants normal yeah normal just sort of ratty pajamas this this movie is great at making it feel like a complete universe mm-hmm. like at one point when they're evacuating the city in the beginning um they pass like a restaurant and there's food still on the mm. tables i didn't notice that mm-hmm. and there's just a lot of great details like that like it feels like a real city under attack mm-hmm. so I want to ask you, yes, as the giant monster person. I am nothing if not that. <laughs> Why? What? What is it about giant monster movies that you like? Um. Well, I mean, for for anyone who hasn't listened before, um, I grew up on Godzilla, okay. like all the, especially all the older Godzillas, the cheesy ones, and also the very serious first one. And so I've always liked this sense of wonder at something larger than you. Hmm. Like this spectacle that that kind of puts people, like mankind, in its place. Hmm. Okay. So it's this weird intersection of I love seeing things blow up. That meets like, I've always been kind of environmental uh, minded. So Because a lot of giant movies are environmentalism. Mm-hmm. Um, nature is you know, responding to man. Mm-hmm. And so... So do you... But, I mean, you still like this movie even though the sort of gawking at the monster doesn't really occur until very late in the film. I mean, that's... You don't really see a lot of direct Mm-mm. shots of him. Which her. I'm okay with. Because with any giant monster movie, there's people on the internet who complain about, oh, we... There's not enough screen time for the monster, but I prefer, like, a gradual reveal. Mm-hmm. Um, the Jaws approach. Yeah, the <laughs> te- I, like, I like my monsters to tease me. Okay. <laughs> this is, okay. Just really excited for Shape of Water. God. <laughs> we cannot literally go one hour without you. I listen. <laughs> yes. But yeah, just giant monsters have always been this really important imagery for me Mm -hmm. and so with Cloverfield it's it was it's a really fresh take or a real grounded not ground well it is very grounded but it's literally from like a grounded perspective being on the ground Mm -hmm. um, just running around like under the feet of the monster more or less okay interesting so this movie came out um it was very successful, like, its first weekend, and then no one went and saw it. Yeah, that sounds about right. It was, like, that <laughs> That really broke my heart, because yeah. I really wanted a direct sequel. And there was a lot of comments on message boards about possibilities for a sequel. Um, the, the major one that I saw was, because at, at one point during the movie, HUD films another person filming what's going on. Mm-hmm. And... The big idea was like, hey, what if the sequel is footage from that mm-hmm. person? Which, you know, again, if we're talking about like if this film was made today, then that would be a window into you know, millions of sequels, really. Because mm-hmm. if we're, everybody has a phone now <laughs> yeah. that's able to take this sort of video. And I was... I was keeping my fingers crossed for that, for that to happen. Then he, mm-hmm. Matt Reeves went off to do um, "Let Me In," and then the very he's done very well with the ape 
movies. Yeah. They've yeah. been very well received. Yep. And Drew Goddard went on to do a lot of good things. Various things. Yeah. yeah. I will say uh, one thing I just want to also briefly call out. Um, you mentioned that, you know, there's there's no music in this, but I will point out that the end credits theme called Roar by Michael Gacino <laughs> is one of my favorite pieces of music. <laughs> like, it's a very... I, I love that piece. <laughs> it's a great homage to like the classic uh, like Godzilla movie mm-hmm. themes and yeah. I love it too. Yeah. And so, the, so yeah, the, so for years, so that was, it came out 2008 and it, like the possibility of the sequel went silent mm-hmm. until... 2016? Yeah, I think it was last year. January 2016, a, a little trailer was dropped mm-hmm. for a movie starring um, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, John Goodman, and... John Gallagher Jr. Mm-hmm. About three people s- stuck in a bunker. Mm-hmm. Again, uh, a teaser trailer, if I recall correctly, a teaser trailer that was a scene rather than a bunch of clips edited together. Wasn't the teaser trailer just that sort of montage to I think we're alone now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were they were, they were just coming about their lives in what you would think is a house. Mm-hmm. And then it reveals that they're in a bunker and they hear something like pass over the top of the bunker. Yeah. And then it's revealed that it's the name of the movie is Ten Cloverfield Lane. And I lost my shit. <laughs> Because it was a, because again, I was in, this was again released before. You were again seeing a Transformers movie. <laughs> no, no, but it was a Michael Bay movie and I saw no, 13 no, Hours. I saw, I, because I wanted to see Special Forces Halpert. Oh my God. I wanted to see buff John Krasinski and that movie is actually a lot better than it has any right to be. All right. Uh, but anyway. In the theater, I was seeing it with a friend, and when Ten Cloverfield Lane came on, I like almost stood up out of my chair, because <laughs> almost a decade later, a follow up to Cloverfield, sort of, sort of, <laughs> and then it's revealed that it's not a direct. No, and I was, I was, I was brought down to reality. And then this movie turned out to be just a fantastic, mm-hmm. like very well acted. Like, yeah, it's I was surprised by everything about this movie. Um, uh, yeah, I saw it for the first time when we watched it mm-hmm. two days ago uh, because a lot of my interest in the first Cloverfield came from the found footage angle, and so this uh, sequel or Semi sequel, spiritual sequel, whatever. Shared universe. Yeah. Um, is not. And so a lot of my sort of interest was sort of taken away by that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just never got around to watching it. But I'm glad that I did. I, I enjoyed it quite a lot. Yeah. So the, the, the movie, well, as with all uh, movies that we do, you should just see it before we talk about it. But the movie follows Mary Elizabeth Winstead's character, um, who is in a fight with her boyfriend and... Yeah, Michelle. Michelle, yeah. Michelle drives off. Um, Bradley Cooper calls her, his little voice <laughs> cameo. And then she gets into a wreck. She wakes up in... Wouldn't it have been great if he had done the, the Rocket Raccoon voice, though? <laughs> <laughs> All the... I feel like all of his voice work should be a shared universe of its own. <laughs> all that could have been. And so she wakes up in what appears to be like a, like a cellar. It's a very... Mattress on the floor, and she her leg is set in a cast that is chained to the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's an IV tube in her. Mm-hmm. Um, and John Goodman comes in, says nothing more or less and leaves her yep howard i guess we don't find that out until later though Mm -hmm. he doesn't give her his name but eventually she tries to escape and that's how she learns she's in a bunker 
and that and Howard tells her the outside world is gone. Mm-hmm. Yep, there's been an attack. And that's pretty much all he can say. He doesn't know where the attack came from, mm-hmm. what kind of attack it is, just that there's been an attack and now the air outside is unable to support life. And she, of course, is extremely skeptical of anything that a man who has chained her to a wall has to say. Mm-hmm. A creepy old white guy. Yeah. Um, until, I guess, a little later on, she gets up to the door. Uh, she the... makes another attempt to escape. Mm-hmm. She makes it up to the door, and um, from the little window of the door, she can see two pig carcasses that are... Well, he shows her. He takes her up one time and shows her the pig carcasses Mm -hmm. that look like they've been eaten away by acid. Yep. And then she escapes another time to try and get out. And that's when she discovers a lady Mm -hmm. who is trying to get in. And whose face is, like, partially eaten away. Right, because her, her sort of theory for the first part of the film is whenever she hears cars mm-hmm. above them, well, how could there be how could there be anybody driving a car if this sort of, you know, if calamitous like new, yeah, yeah. This attack has happened the way he said it is. So the next time that she hears a car... She manages to get the keys to the door away from him, runs up the stairs, and then is greeted by the woman driving the car, who indeed has these sort of horrible lesions all over her face. Mm -hmm. And so it's... And appears to be... I don't know, do you think that she was supposed to be kind of psychotic because of whatever the effects of the attack were? Or do you think that it was I think she was so badly, like, burned? Mm -hmm. Or... That she lost her mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's Michelle, Howard, and... Emmett. And Emmett, John Gallagher Jr.'s character, who was... It's a real change of pace for John Gallagher Jr., who... I don't know, I've never seen him play kind of like a scruffy, like a redneck type. This is set in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, I think he's a great... Actor, I think there's a lot of great things ahead of him. Um, he was fantastic in Short Term 12, which is a perfect movie, but real day ruiner. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the direct opposite of his, his role in the newsroom. And and Hush, um, which is a movie that Lynn really likes, but I thought was pretty bad. Okay. She's not here to defend uh, herself. Uh-huh. <laughs> But, I haven't seen it, so I can't help you out. I'm sorry, girl. <laughs> so it's the three of them, and at the beginning, where they're learning just who each other are, Howard is very troubling. Yes. <laughs> but, but what do you mean by that? Like, um, he's he seems like someone who doesn't really know to how. At first, he doesn't really know how to act. With other people, or mm-hmm. um, just lacking social skills. Yeah. And, like, he's very uncomfortable. Like, he gets, like, violent. Yes. When Emmett and Michelle interact. Like, in a, he, Howard acts jealous. Yes. And um, that's, like, your first red flags. Yeah. And there's also kind of a sense that, you know... He, he has a couple of lines where he talks about how, you know, everybody laughed at me or mm-hmm. never, nobody took me seriously when I was building this bunker. And, you know, there is a conversation that happens about whether things that they regret not doing before this attack happened. And he claims to not have any regret, regrets because he spent all of his life preparing for Doomsday and now Doomsday is here. So... He uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like... This movie is very much like, what if your doomsday prepping neighbor was right? Yeah, but also what if your doomsday prepping neighbor was as psychotic as you like think he is? <laughs> mm-hmm. It just so happens they're right. And so so after after Michelle like sees the woman trying to break in, um, there's kind of this like 
they almost humanize Howard. Mm-hmm. They well, they do. They, yeah, absolutely. She he has Michelle um, sew him back up because she she hit him over the head with a bottle. Yep, and she was a wannabe fashion designer, mm-hmm. right? And so Which, he brings he brings her a little sewing kit, and she stitches up his head for him. Mm-hmm. That that skill actually. Uh, Comes into play. Absolutely, which is always very nice to see that mm-hmm. your traditionally feminine coded skill comes comes in handy just as much as all of Howard's doomsday. Yeah. Like Michelle is one of the most resourceful heroines this side of like Ripley. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. One of the main sort of things that humanizes his character is that he is always referring to a daughter Mm -hmm. that he lost um he does never go into detail about what happened to her just that she's not with us anymore and that well he mentioned that um his wife took her that they moved to chicago and so so like you're kind of shown this man who seems to have been who you're who you believe was kind of broken Mm -hmm. by his family falling apart Mm -hmm. And, like, he shows Michelle a picture of the daughter. Um, and so then there's kind of just this hangout montage of the three of them. Killing time. Killing time. Killing time in the apocalypse, basically. Yeah. Like, what What do you do? Well, you play board games. <laughs> puzzles. <laughs> you do puzzles. <laughs> um, yeah. Watch a lot of movies. And then um, something happens with the trash shoot yep and because of like how the bunker is set up the only person that could reach the the clog Mm -hmm. is michelle because she's the tiniest yeah she fits into the vents Mm -hmm. and so she goes through and there she discovers um a message scratched into the glass it's another it's another exit for the bunker yep and there's someone scratched help, and there's, like, blood on it, but it's it's on the inside of the bunker. Yeah. And she also discovers a pair of earrings mm-hmm. with blood on them. Yep, earrings that are the same as the ones in the picture that Howard showed of the girl that was supposedly his daughter. Mm-hmm. And? Which oh. turns out not to be true. So Michelle and Emmett sort of start plotting against him a little bit when mm-hmm. it when it turns out that he's the, a pedophile yeah the girl in question is not his daughter but rather a girl that went missing from a local high school and was never found again mm-hmm. uh so they start preparing all these ways to get get rid of howard basically to get the gun away from him and michelle starts sewing a suit out of a shower curtain a hazmat suit yeah yep and basically they decide that one of them will have to keep watch over howard and the other one will put on the suit and the homemade gas mask and go find help out in the world they're willing to risk it Mm -hmm. and while like this movie is so claustrophobic yes not for not for people who can't do small spaces no it's so stressful um like there's one particular scene that's this was uh when we watched it this was the second time i had seen it Mm -hmm. and it it really holds up and just how stressful it is because how john goodman is terrifying Mm -hmm. as howard yeah um and they at one point while emmett and michelle are plotting they they end up playing like Pictionary, not Pictionary, but um. Oh yeah, like taboo, I guess. Yeah, kind of. taboo, and Emmett. I mean, it's very creepy, and then it turns even. It goes from creepy to stressful, because like Emmett's word is um. Emmett's word for Howard is woman, and Emmett's clue is, what is Michelle. And Howard's just like, girl, little girl, Child. princess. And all these like creepy, possessive, mm-hmm. gross age gap differences. Yeah. 
and it's so awful. And then, so then it's um, Howard's turn for Emmett. And Howard's just like, I see you when I'm sleeping. Or I see you when you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. I know what you're doing. I know what you're planning. Mm -hmm. And this, and the scene like ratchets it, ratchets it up and up. And finally it's revealed to be like Santa Claus. Like, and it's, that's a great, well done moment. Yeah. John Goodman is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, Particularly, you know, it's it's interesting. I would say that probably the creepy, the creepiest part for him is the part where you can't hear, you can't even hear what he's saying, because the uh, a lot of his acting is just I don't know. He just does a lot with his facial expressions and hands with his body. Yeah. yeah. Um, but because a gun has just gone off because he killed Emmett. Uh, we can't hear what he's saying, except the only sort of thing that we can make out by the end is him telling Michelle, like, this is how it was always supposed to be. It's okay. It's just us now. Yeah. It's, Horrifying. It's awful. Horrifying. This this movie actually has one of my greatest fears. What's that? Which is, like, my fear of being dissolved. Oh, wow. <laughs> like... <laughs> That's that, a very specific fear. That's, that's up there with, like, sharks for me. Okay. Um, and because at one point, Howard discovers, like, supplies missing mm-hmm. from around the bunker. And he, he corners Emmett and Michelle around a vat of acid. And he's telling them he's going to put them in it. And he eventually, he shoots Emmett. And later on, you briefly see his body in the acid. And it's just... Ugh. Yep. Yeah, basically, I mean, at the end of the day, Michelle decides that she would rather brave poisoned air than stay with Howard for another minute, which I feel is a choice that, that most any. of us would make. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Um, so she... She... She successfully gets out of the bunker. She, not before dumping a vat of acid on John Goodman, who then, like, limps after her, horribly disfigured. I will say, um, the one sort of part that I was not as into for this film, Mm -hmm. when she eventually does surface and makes it out of the bunker, um... There's a kind of extended sequence where she is basically trying to get a car to start. But, uh, surprise, it's aliens. The attack came from aliens. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, I don't know, I felt like that scene went on for a little too long. um, Where there's there's one alien in particular that's in the cornfields that comes and, you know, she has to hide in a shed. And then there's an alien ship. That's also, you know, spraying what we, I, you know, the sort of green smoke, which is assumed to be the... What, the, the attack, yeah. Yep. I don't know. I wasn't as, I wasn't as into that part. I felt like, you know, I did like the moment where, you know, when she, finally she sees some geese flying, and so she takes off her gas mask, and then on the horizon she then sees an alien spaceship, and her immediate reaction is just to be like... Come on. Mm-hmm. Which, same. <laughs> I, I would have been okay with the movie ending, like, just with her standing on the truck, seeing a spaceship fly across the horizon. Like, that yeah. would have been a fun ending. A real Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. Um, a, lot, a lot of critics were very upset about aliens, which I feel like since... Why? <laughs> just... <laughs> Because like what you just said, like, I don't th- I don't have a problem with there being aliens. Mm-hmm. I just felt like it was too long. Well, of a pe- scene. it's the pe- kind of people who complain about a horror movie that when it's well done about it being a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I I like that this now Cloverfield universe has a lot of genre elements, giant monsters, aliens, mm-hmm. and they all they're both are very well done. Um, I really like the, her kind of like, her real heroic ending. Yeah. Like. I understand, like, that's kind of, they needed to sort of have a, a sort of a happier conclusion for her character, mm-hmm. um, and a kind of button on, 
a monologue that she gives earlier in the film where she, you know, has always wanted to help people more than she feels that she actually has. And so the film ends with her turning not towards the, like, sort of evacuation point, but towards uh, Houston where somebody is radio broadcasting that if you have combat experience, we need your help. Which I love that moment because it felt like a real, like, badass origin story. Yeah, I think they could have kept that moment and just trimmed down the, the face-off with the various aliens in mm-hmm. the, on the outside of the farm. I don't know. I felt like keeping it, keeping it more sort of focused on the, like, human horror aspect of the stuff that happens in the bunker is more effective than her facing off with an alien space, you know, an alien ship. Yeah, it's definitely, the the horrors of Howard are way more weighty mm-hmm. than tentacle space monsters. Yep. But would you say, like, some people went as far as saying, like, the overall movie was harmed by including aliens at the end. No, I don't think that, I'm fine with them being there. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't think that the aliens are what makes it a horror film. So I could do without them. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I, I can agree with that. I, I like the aliens. Um, I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> I like the aliens. I like the monsters. Not so much about the acid, though. <laughs> no. No no acid, please. But I feel like people should have expected some genre bent, considering, because, like, J.J. Abrams acknowledged that, like, this is kind of an the Cloverfield anthology. Mm-hmm. Like, you see a brief ad for Slusho, um, but they definitely don't take place in the same no, universe. not at all. And there is there is a third Cloverfield movie coming. Yep. God uh, Particle. Mm-hmm. 2018. It, it's a, it looks like a really good cast. Yeah. It's way more prominent than, um, or at least, I don't know. No, I would say there's way more big names Mm -hmm. because, you know, 10 Cloverfield Lane, there's only three characters, Mm -hmm. really. And, I mean, John Goodman is obviously a legend, but Mary Elizabeth Winstead and John Gallagher Jr., I would say, are sort of less... Less no. Yeah, they're not really household names. Well, Um, unless... Well, wait, she was a nominee. Um, It's a crime that Mary Elizabeth Winstead was not nominated for an Emmy for Fargo this season. Yeah. Quick aside. <laughs> so you have final thoughts on either of the films or the universe in general? The next movie, I guess, is going to be actually in space. Mm-hmm. So I assume that aliens will be there, too. <laughs> I am I am doing my Mr. Burns impression. Yes. Stop. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, I'm kind of sad that the that's not just going to appear as suddenly as the other two movies mm-hmm. that we we now know in advance but i'm still very excited Mm -hmm. um i wholeheartedly recommend both these movies um the first one is a very unique approach to giant monster movies and the second one is a very claustrophobic thriller until you get yeah they're they're very one one is very big and one is very small Mm -hmm. (laughs) one has to do with tight enclosed places and the other one has to do with Giant cities being destroyed by even gianter monsters. Yeah. So. What about you? What are your final thoughts? Um, I like both of them very much. Um, I think that if you are somebody who can tolerate shaky cam, you should absolutely watch Cloverfield. Um, I think that it's, you know, overall very charming. This mm-hmm. is, I would say my favorite tj miller film <laughs> absolutely my favorite thing he's ever done <laughs> what? even more than how to train your dragon i'm not as big of a fan of that as you are that movie is perfect oh. and i will fight anyone oh. about that okay well <laughs> that is that is actually my favorite movie of all time okay just fun fact for all you listeners <laughs> Um, as for 10 cloverfield lane yes i would recommend it i don't think that it I don't know that I like it quite as much as I like the original film, but the first 
well, I would say maybe 90% of the film, I liked very much, mm-hmm. indeed. I, I would watch the first Cloverfield more than the second one, because the second one is very stressful. Mm-hmm. So, um, I don't know if you want to do this in a public forum, but Wyeth, we got in a fight earlier this week. We did? Yes, we did. And it was a fight over it. Oh, so <laughs> it is still going strong at the box office and has generated lots of discourse among Anne Louise, Lynn, and myself. Yeah, it's now on track to be the highest grossing horror film of all time. It'll outgross, well, not adjusted for inflation. Though. Yeah. But it will outgross Six Cents pretty soon. Oh, man. That's, that's quite a long time since we've had something that big. Yeah, um... Exorcist still leaves it in the dust, though, if you adjust for inflation. But Which, I feel like that movie holds up. Of course it does. <laughs> but, so, yes, there's been a lot of discourse about, I, I, you know, some of the things that we brought up in our discussion about it. Minority characters that were not given the same kind of treatment that a lot of the other kids in that film were, specifically... Mike and Stan. Which, um, Hashtag justice for Stan. <laughs> it's come out that Andy Machete um, the plans on an at least 15-minute extended edition for home release. Well, I hope that it's all Mike and Stan. Because... I hope so, too. <laughs> um, um, and it's also been revealed about... Well, it's not set in stone, but um, the... Andy has talked about how he might want to take um, it chapter two. Yep. And it's been revealed that, well, in the book, Mike stays in Derry. He's the only character to stay in Derry, yes. And he becomes a town librarian. Yep. And it's been revealed that the idea is being bandied about that in the movie, he becomes a drug addict. Yes, a junkie librarian, I believe, was the cur- was the exact phrase yeah. that he used. He wanted to see Mike be a junkie librarian. And here's... I Give your thoughts. I hate this <laughs> um, because I feel like the whole sort of point of Mike being a character, and again, in the book, it... Ho- you know, everything is sort of filtered through the fact that it is set in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the horrific shit that Mike has to put up with, not just from, you know, demonic entities, but just living in the world. Comes Racism. Be- comes because he is black. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he is the character who is stable enough to stay in Derry and yet maintain his sanity for 27 years and isn't, you know, the one who brings everybody back to fulfill their promise to kill it 27 years later, I think is sort of the point of his character that he has gone through so much, but remains kind of this like, relative you know this very stable focal point for the friends for the for the losers club you you said that you were open to this idea here here are my thoughts i think having mike become a junkie feels kind of poor like a poor cliche yes but i mean i think if he were to become like an alcoholic (laughs) <laughs> like, I see what they're trying to get at as, like, he remained in this evil town and so close to this evil entity that he has to, like, I feel like anyone would be driven to drink or try some way to not feel, to numb themselves to this evil. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like making, having that change happen to your one black character is problematic. <laughs> I think I think it's problematic too. I just also think that to have a character be squeaky clean in the face of evil like battling evil seems kind of impossible. Well this I mean Stephen King has a not super great track record with characters of color. Yeah. 
So, I don't know. For me, Mike has always been in the upper echelons of characters who were not, you know, sort of magic, quote unquote, magical Negroes. Um, and not drug addicts. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think, you know, of course, my my response to you in our in our group chat was that if anybody should be a drug addict, it, it's it would clearly be the Stephen King self insert Bill. Bill. <laughs> but I don't know. What do you think about them making it two movies? I like that. Really, I don't. <laughs> It, if we got the whole the thousand page book crammed into a three hour movie, a lot of injustice to either to either age. No, either but I mean the second chapter. They're talking about making the second chapter two movies. What? Yes, I have not heard that. Yes. Oh, I don't like that. Okay, good. <laughs> like if they. Okay, we're not in a fight anymore. <laughs> okay, well, there's just I'm. I'm just ready to see how they do it. I feel like if there's, you know, I would hope that in opening this strong and all of the money that they are continuing to make, I would hope that that would lead them, like in a perfect world, that would lead them to trust their audience more. Trust their audience and trust their director. Right. But I don't know. I, I see it. I see it coming. I see it like the same way they did the Hobbit series, the same way they did the last Harry Potter book. Well, like, okay, mm-mm. I think they did a great job. Warner Brothers. I think they did a great job with um, with the Deathly Hallows. However, they definitely botched the Hobbit. Mm. I don't think people tend to blame Peter Jackson for that, but I feel like that was more Warner Brothers not trusting. Peter Jackson, even though he's proven competent for the source material. See, I my hope is that all of this sort of like general populist acclaim for this film, hopefully somebody will be like, you know what, we could make this movie three hours long and people would go and see it. Yeah. I would rather have one long ass movie than two movies that are like needlessly stretched out. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I did read that... Um, They're intending on including some footage, some more footage of the kids in the second movie. I like that. But that just sort of leads me to believe that they better start shooting now because those kids are are growing up so fast. Those kids are really on the cusp of puberty. (laughs) Also, since we saw it, I would just like to brag about myself. Oh, oh great. (laughs) This is why I come on this podcast. The 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 train for Jessica Chastain has been in (laughs) full motion. Lots lots of support for her as older Bev. All right. So so I'm uh, I'm feeling pretty good. All right. Fair enough. Well. Anything else? I think that's it. Are you ready to do your personal pick? Do you have a personal pick? I do not. (laughs) You don't. I don't. This this week has just been one. One long cluster cuss of school. (laughs) All right, I'll put in a plug for a short story. Hmm. Um, In the spirit of our our continued it discussion, I will recommend the short story "The Man in the Black Suit" by Stephen King. Um, It came out in the mid '90s. Uh, initially in the New Yorker and then won a bunch of like short fiction awards and was eventually included in Everything's Eventual, that story collection. You can find it online if you look for it. It's Mm -hmm. fairly easy to find. It's a very quick read. It's a very brief short story. And much like it, it is from the perspective of well it's actually an old man looking back on an event that happened to him as a child Hmm. but the main character is a child through the bulk of the story and it's basically about a kid encountering the devil and uh yeah it's i mean i think that it's one of his best works like really yeah wow yeah i i will highly highly recommend it i would rather he write 
way more short stories like that than some of his other kind of longer, more bloated or self-indulgent mm. novels. So, The Man in the Black Suit from 1994. Check it out. <laughs> well, there you have it. Well, <laughs> thanks for listening this week. Um, Lynn, we miss you. As always, we, we have a very interesting pick next week um lynn's pick and i don't i won't spoil that but i feel like it's going to be a wild one and october is right around the corner (laughs) watch out for it it's a coming watch out for october man (laughs) all right love you bye king behaved like a man demented obsessed utterly lost